you know, I, I think we're we're very lucky to have a, a campus that's uh, uh, as large and, and well appointed as this one. So yeah, there have been a, a, a number of folks, um, not locally but but outside of the area, who have indicated that they you know potentially could could do something similar and, and see the value for branding for having the you know the, the collisions with entrepreneurs and their employees and then having the development opportunity as well okay so you know in my cloud world you know everything's about mobility uh, access to information anytime anywhere completely mobile workforce yet you're making the case to come to a specific location to work so that's somewhat counterintuitive so um, is it possible that the mobility and the sharing kind of economy that we have, that you would have competition online and people wouldn't actually have to come to your location to get the kind of services that you provide? Ann? Um, I would have to say I, I, I completely understand what you're saying when you say that, but at the end of the day, we are humans and we do have human characteristics. And what I've seen occurring in my space specifically is that People don't like being isolated. They like to be around other people. Their ideas are growing as they are able to collide with others and um, be able to spitball with other people versus always, I think our, uh, quite frankly, I think our space allows people to be mobile. It gives them just another space to go to to, um, to foster what they're doing. Okay. How about uh, kind of what you're doing? Yeah, and I, I would say that one of the uh, the we we our process essentially ends with uh, the uh, the companies coming in and meeting our team, seeing the space, uh, getting a tour of the campus, um, and and the the thing that we always hear is you know we're currently working out of our townhouse townhouse or an office space, and it's hard for me to hire employees. I can't meet clients there, so I'm always you know when when there's an opportunity, I have to scramble to figure something out. Uh, there aren't good food options. There's no gym. So I mean some of these things that that are uh, we sort of take for granted uh, at an early stage company in, you know, without having a, a huge check from a venture fund don't exist. And, and so that's, a, I think, a necessary service that we provide. Um, one of the other things about our program, I think, that um, makes it great for the, the companies to actually show up in a physical location um, is the fact that we work with, uh, you know, we work with companies of all, sort of all ages. Um, you know, the, they'll generally be around the seed stage, but some have, you know, just gotten a first investment or just have uh, friends and family money. Um, others are moving more towards a, a Series A round where they're, they're raising some substantial capital. So they also do have that, that camaraderie, the opportunity to work with people who have been through what, what they're about to go through and, and get that sort of advice, which um, I guess to some degree it could be re uh, reproduced online, but, um, you know, a lot of the just the people-to-people the -people interaction and the, the, uh, the collisions that, that – uh, wouldn't occur otherwise, uh, wouldn't happen, I don't think. Okay, Grafton made me sit down. So, all right, let's dig at that a little bit. I mean, I, I can tell you that one of the things about being an entrepreneur on your own is loneliness and not having the ability to have other critical thinkers work with you when you're making big decisions. So you both mentioned the word collisions, I like that. But what do you do... Now, I don't want to say formally, but is there a process that you have that has been developed to give it a little more structure for people, or is it pretty much just haphazard how people work together? Um, specifically at Brickyard, I think what we did is we addressed from – so Paul and I, we come from two very different industries, and that's why we were able to look at things different ways from a different lens. And I, I'd like to say when we talk about collisions, it's just being strategic about how we're setting up our space and what sort of amenities we're offering and what sort of, sort of events are happening in our space that then I think it just naturally falls into place after you look at those sorts of things that, um, you know, for instance, there's only one way in and out of our space. You've got to walk by people to get in and out of our space. And, you know, there's a flow to it. And I think that's really important because otherwise, um, that's when I think people may start avoiding <laughs> each other. So they're forced into this in a, in a good way. And I, all I've seen is complete positive response. And um, I, I, I think it's really worked out. Okay, Nick? 
we do two things, and, and not necessarily on purpose, um, but we put 10 companies in about 500 square feet, so it's hard for them. It's a you know, very close quarter, so it's, it's hard for them not to get to know each other and not to speak and not to interact. Um, and also, Fishbowl is on the opposite side of the building from the cafeteria. So what we find is that companies end up, you know, it's time for lunch, let's all head on over and, and you know, always spot them together in, in the cafeteria. So we've created those sort of, you know, just the general working where they're together uh, closely. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, breakfast and lunch, they, they have the opportunity to get together and, you know, talk about things that, that uh, you know, they, they probably wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, but if you had a situation where people really want to interact make some decisions, get some advice. Do you feel like there's ever a time when you'd want to at least have confidentiality agreements between your tenants or some kind of formal process for processing issues? Or it's going to stay informal and that's the way it ought to be? Uh, I, I'd say the, the fact that it's informal has really worked to our favor. I mean, we've, we've generally looked at companies that we, we really liked the founding teams. We thought they had interesting products and and decided that it, you know, there were there were opportunities that we could leverage some of our strengths to help them, and it's worked out pretty well. Um, so I think having that a little bit of the the informal nature has been certainly helpful for our program. I think if we had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, just a lot of bureaucracy uh, would have been would have been challenging. Um, we do have monthly meetings with the companies, so that's definitely an opportunity for them if they want to, have, if they have other questions or, or you know need help with something. They they have a, a sort of a uh, an opportunity away from the group to discuss those, but certainly we're we're quite available for them uh, at that you know at any time as well. I, I think specifically from my viewpoint, what I, when you look at co-working, it's about collaborative work, and so you come in with the notion knowing that everything is visible in our space. It's glass walls. There's whiteboards on the wall. You're next. You're working next to. Um, somebody that you otherwise might not be working with. So I think there, it, it's an understanding that that is the nature of the workspace. But in terms of um, other companies looking for just some confidential advice or whatnot, Paul and I both make ourselves accessible to our clients that we can meet in some of our private spaces that we have. And we certainly have confidentiality, com confidentiality agreements with our members. Um, and we also, for example, yesterday we just did a little fireside chat with some of our um, members and kept it between four of us, some of the things that they were looking for and what they were working on, and I thought it was pretty successful. Okay, good. Um, you know, you've both really answered this question, but uh, it came up a number of times in our technology committee uh, talking about this. And, and I think what one, everyone wants to know is in your own way, do you believe that this is a trend, or do you believe this is a complete paradigm shift? Where do you put this? <laughs> you both kind of answered it already. I mean, I think I know you, you both think it's pretty major. I, I think it's pretty major, certainly for this area. Um, I mean, there are other areas that are that are trying to set up these sort of uh, various programs to to help entrepreneurs, whether it's at the university level or county level or city level I mean I think uh, you know uh, the, the types of jobs that these these companies create um, you know, people want to have these types of companies in their community so so I would say that there's there's a, a, a very dramatic shift it's it's uh, I've lived in a number of areas and have seen it in in all places so yeah absolutely I have to agree with Nick I think this is a shift and I see it um, from both perspectives now being in the industry of collaborative working and from coming from a real estate background I would say this is a major shift that we're looking at. I, uh, I think some of you know that my co-founder, Paul, is out on the road right now, currently doing a tech tour in all smaller communities, smaller tiered cities. The need is here, and it's not just in Loudoun. This is existing throughout our country, and you know, I, I think it's something that we're gonna see continue to grow. Okay, well, let's talk about it in terms of, of where you're located. Um, what can you say about Northern Virginia in terms of, uh, or Loudoun, in terms of your success? Is it because the technology, uh, the internet, the, uh, what, what about it is appealing? Well, I would say where it all started is from companies such as AOL, that what AOL did to this area um, is not necessarily uncommon, but it brought, I think, a highly educated, group of people here that um, 
are now have opportunities to not just work for the big corporations, but to really um, be able to follow their passions and become entrepreneurs. And they're not necessarily these humongous companies. They're, they may be 10 people, seven people, five people, and um, they may never grow bigger than that. And I think what's happened is specifically in Northern Virginia and in Loudoun, um, these, this community has nowhere to work. So they're shuffling not just into DC, but m may be completely leaving the area altogether. And I think that's a tragedy. I think we need to keep our best and brightest here. And I think we need to continue to encourage their growth within our own community. I would echo that and say that, I mean, the, I think the, the types of companies and the, the demographics of the entrepreneurs that, that we meet through Fishbowl are, are, I think, a little different than you'd expect. I mean, many of these folks are, are uh, you know, they were executives at a, at a tech company or, or a product company. Um, you know, they have families, they live in the area, they want to work in the area, they want to stay in the area. So creating opportunities for them to stay here is, is certainly very important for us. And, you know, we can, we can do it to a small degree in, in Fishbowl, but, you know, once companies start to get a little bit larger, uh, it, it does appear that there is a gap for them to, to be able to continue working within our community. Okay, let's uh, think about that. So you, you um, I can say you're disruptive, right? That's pretty safe to say that in terms of, you know, small businesses getting out of their uh, closet or basement and uh, into space, that's disruptive. You're obviously here disruptive at, at AOL. So what are those disruptions causing? Like, what's the next thing to crack? You mentioned that uh, they need a landing spot, for example. What other ripples are going to happen based on what you see happening in your own businesses? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say what I think is really disruptive is, or, or what we're seeing is not just creating this physical space to allow these companies to thrive, but also... Um, I think what's going to go hand in hand with it is we're going to start encouraging what these girls are doing from a really young age or across the spectrum is you're, you're going to see the education level of coding and, um, uh, you know, any other sort of technology-based education. I think that also we need to start promoting our local investors to stay within our marketplace. Um, and... I, I see that's where we're gonna be filling in the gaps at the bottom. We really need to fill in the gaps at the bottom for our entrepreneurs and small businesses. One of the interesting things that, that I've seen here, I, I moved to the area in January of 2015, I've lived in Connecticut for a couple years, um, and, and the difference in the community with respect to how they support businesses is, is a, a very dramatic. Um, you know, in, in Connecticut, I had several friends who attempted to start a company and, and ended up starting a company, but the amount of time and effort and money that they put into just the basic building blocks of, of you know, barely getting off the ground was tremendous and, and could have been better spent uh, actually building their business and actually building their product. Uh, and I, I'd say that in, in Northern Virginia and, and Loudoun County, I think we do a good job of, of providing a lot of those services, trying to provide that education, uh, openly communicating these sorts of opportunities to companies, so it ends up you know, allowing them to put their effort where it matters rather than just a logistical and bureaucracy. Um, and I'd, I'd say that, uh, you know, we're seeing, even in, in my, my time here, a little over a year, the, the number of services that are being offered to startups. Like, everyone's trying to figure out how they can work with these companies. Is there some, you know, some strength that they have that they can leverage to, to help startups uh, stay in the area? And, and that's pretty, uh, pretty exciting. I mean, there, there are a number of, you know, even, even programs that are focused on companies earlier than... Uh, than, than Fishbowl is, so, so Mach 37 is a great example of, of you know, uh, finding a number of uh, leaders in the cybersecurity space, figuring out how they can best help these very early stage companies, both with uh, capital, mentorship, um, and, and uh, so I, I think we'll see, you know, additional, additional, uh, additional opportunities like that. Okay, you know when you, uh, I ask you the Loudon question, or why Northern Virginia, and uh, a tech guy, I'm sitting here thinking, no, well, we've got the internet, you know, we got 200 networks interchanged over here. In the but you said it was the people. I think that's really interesting. Is there anything that you could uh, say about the people that you've been involved with? Is there any consistency, any character traits, any 
anything that you see that, oh, that's somebody that's going to be successful or that's going to be somebody that I need to have in my program? Yeah, everyone's really nice, uh, which is a little <laughs> bit different from the north. Um, but uh, almost every company that we've encountered not only you know, wants to, to access our services but figure out how they can give back. Um, so whether it's uh, you know, one company that's going through funding rounds and referring later companies to the, the investors they built relationships with or just offering mentoring to each other, whether they're in the fishbowl program or whether they're folks they meet at events that we host here, that to me seems to be something quite unique. And, and I've worked in uh, uh, Baltimore and New York and Connecticut and didn't see, uh, didn't see that same sort of flavor. I mean, I have to agree with what Nick said in terms of, in terms of people just being unique here. They're very passionate. Um, I think another shift that we will see, and we will s we're, we're already seeing it, is that um, people's career paths are changing. Um, the generations before us, the, uh, you worked one career at a large corporation or a large business for the most part throughout your career, and then you know, our next generations are looking at working several jobs throughout their careers in several different industries. And now we're really looking at people working multiple, working on multiple things at the same time. And it's very important to continue to encourage that because um, when I look at our members, that's what is so unique about them is they're so passionate about what they're doing. So is this mostly young people, or is there any hope for, like, you know, a 60-year-old technology guy? I'll hop in really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, I think with what we are doing at Brickyard, the metrics were so unknown, and they still are unknown, and the model is, but I, I promise you, the demographic ranges, it's a lot different than what you may see at a WeWork in DuPont. Um, when you come into our space, you'll see anybody from their late 20s quite frankly, up until their 70s. I mean, people, you know, we have members that are working on things now that they're in retirement, and it's really neat to see everybody come together. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, you know, to echo my earlier comment, we uh, we generally see perhaps an older demographic than you'd expect, um, which I think probably plays into the unique nature of our community as well as just, you know, the, the willingness for everyone to help each other. It's less of a you know, I have to be successful, but how can we make this community successful? And I've had a number of, uh, you know, I have these monthly meetings with with our founders, and I always, you know, end the meeting by saying, you know, what can I do to help you? And, um, you know, a handful of them will will uh, respond back and say, well, what can I do to help you? So um, that's definitely a, a, a unique, I think, a unique aspect of it. So there's a chance for the old guys, huh? And you got it. And women, of course. Um, you know, I. It's unfortunate Rick's not here, so I'm going to lean on you, Nick, for this, and, and feel free to, to weigh in, Ann. But um, talk about funding a little bit. Like, I there was a time, and not too long ago, when that was the big criticism of the technology entrepreneurship kind of thing in Northern Virginia, especially Loudoun, is that we didn't have that line of investors who, who are ready and willing to jump in. So talk about that. and how it is today. I know you haven't been here long, but and maybe how you see that changing. Yeah. Uh, so there's actually a, a fairly substantial number of angel groups in the area. Um, and one of the, the, the uh, goals that we have for, for this year is to try to make more connections with those groups and be able to, you know, basically have an opportunity to, uh, uh, one, one of our companies are, are raising money to be able to, to share them with a number of qualified investors. Uh, and, and so I'd say that the gap is probably less on that end. Uh, in fact, that the you know many of our companies, uh, when when they're raising you know somewhere in the two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollar range, uh, ha have indicated that they don't see a problem there. Um, and perhaps that's you know the companies we work with, but but that's what they've communicated to us. Um, the area where things become a little more challenging, I think, are when they start moving towards Series Series A. I mean, there's there's a number of, of companies in the area, and even some of these angel groups are starting to go up a little bit more and and, and invest one to two million uh, to to be able to uh, to close that gap. Um, but you know, in almost every case, you know, companies end up having to go to New York and they have to go to uh, uh, the West Coast. Um, you know, fortunately, Threat Quotient was able to source most of their round from NEA and and you know work with uh, some uh, local partners there. Um, but even during, you know, uh, I can think of three or four other examples where companies are, you know, basically for the next three months, I can't work on my product because I have to hit the road and, and start speaking to investors. 
So I know a lot of people in the room are, are technology people and, and really don't understand that part of it. Could you, if there is a typical process for how your companies are getting started, maybe, I don't know, family money or something, and how they step up the ladder? Sure. So I'd say uh, for a typical company um, that's, that's going to for the uh, traditional venture funding route, um, you know, most will end up raising uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand from friends and family. And I think part of the strength of, of many of these individuals being later along in their careers is they can, in some cases, self-fund uh, to get to the point where they're actually getting traction and, and uh, gaining customers and, and go a more traditional funding route. Um, Mach 37 has provided a great pipeline of, of cybersecurity companies. Um, you know, they, they invest from, from their own fund as well as CIT. Um, you know, getting to that seed stage where, where companies have raised maybe two two hundred and fifty thousand to, to five hundred thousand. You know, oftentimes they'll then go to an angel group and and probably raise somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred thousand. And then after that, it's sort of it ranges all over the place. But that's when you get to a, a Series A round where uh, you know many many of these companies end up raising um, you know threat quotient raised ten million, urgently raised uh, about seven million. Um, and in many cases there, they, they have to go to your more traditional venture capitalists or your more traditional institutional investors that are comfortable with writing those larger checks. Okay, how about these angel groups? I mean, we certainly have wealth in Loudoun County, and I, I bet there are a lot of investors who would like to get in on things at a small, I don't know what level, but not a quarter million, but maybe twenty-five, fifty, and get together. What angel groups are operating out here, or how do people get involved in that? Sure. So I think there's there's uh, probably two. I'd say two buckets. I mean, there's the more traditional angel investors that that operate outside of a consortium and, and are really just you know they end up becoming fairly close with the founders and, and maybe become a mentor and and uh, you know may invest somewhere in the twenty five to fifty thousand dollar range. Uh, you know, the venture groups that that we've begun working with are uh, uh, Next Gen Angels uh, has been a, a pretty popular one. Um, new Dominion Angels is a, a new one that's that's uh, or new to us at least that, that we've begun speaking to. Uh, Baltimore Angels. Uh, I used to work in Baltimore, so I know a lot of the folks that are involved there. Many of them are, are actually AOL employees, so those are some of the ones that we we probably deal with uh, a little more frequently. But um, I mean, honestly, there's 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 a there's a ton in the area. Uh, uh, Blue Ventures is a, another one that focused on cybersecurity that's been very popular for uh, a number of our companies. Okay, I know that. Uh I actually went to the pitch event at Mach 37 last, I don't even remember when it was, not too long ago. So do you do something similar to that? How do you get, how's that interaction between the companies and angel investors happen? Is it in a group? Is it one-on-one? Uh, -on -one? How, how, do, how do you do that? Sure. So uh, we, we've held pitch events in the past. Uh, many of our companies are just uh, at different stages, so it makes it a little hard from a logistical perspective to be able to figure out, you know, how to how to schedule that sort of event. I mean, some some angel groups will be focused on a particular vertical; others will just be, you know, focused on what sorts of, uh, you know, just interesting entrepreneurs and interesting products. Uh, so the the way that we'll generally go about it is we we have a, a roster of of angel groups and and early stage venture investors that. When the time is right, we, we make those introductions, uh, and it's generally done on a, either a one-on-one -on -one fashion. Uh, so, for example, uh, after Tech Breakfast last week, a, a fairly well-known uh, VC firm came in and uh, spoke with three or four of our companies. Uh, so that was very exciting. Um, but uh, you know, other other uh, angel groups will have pitch events where they'll bring in you know maybe six or eight companies and, and do it more in that that sort of group fashion. Okay. Do you? I feel like I'm answering all the questions. I, I'd be happy to take some questions from the group out here if uh, anybody has a question they'd like to ask. Do I have a first question guy? I can't really see out there, but I see a hand up there. Oh, hey, Jason. <laughs> Should we pass a mic or can everybody hear? Okay. How am I going to repeat that, Jason? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I, let, let me repeat it a little bit here for our presentation. 
So Jason's asking, what are the services that you may need from the business community as a whole that would be helpful? I think in our early stages, what we're starting to learn is what, um, for our specific community, what we're looking at is that they are searching more. So for co-working, these are established companies or people working on their projects. They're not necessarily looking for funding or um, some may be, but that's not the purpose of what our space is. What, um, but they are looking for everyday business services. Quite frankly, you know, maybe it's some. I had a member ask me the other day if I had a good accountant, business accountant that he that could work with somebody that he's a startup, a small entrepreneur that's not, you know. So I think those are the things that we're looking at, and then certainly um, the our members are looking for the events. So we're going to start hosting events through our space. We've, um, you know, talked with small business and Department of Economic Development to start hosting things that are um, specific to the needs of our members. I hope that answers the question. Sure. I would say that the, the number one uh, issue that our companies run into is, is hiring and figuring out how to hire, who to hire, when to hire. Um, and, and being able to find qualified candidates. Uh, so that's that's probably a, an area of need. Um, I, I was gonna also mention uh, events, so now I know where to, where to send them. I mean, we host a number of events here, but um, you know, obviously with, with your, your scale, it probably makes a little bit more sense. Um, and uh, a third thing I would say, I mean, we're able to offer a number of services, I mean, you know, more along the lines of, of mentorship, and if they have a, a tax question, we might be able to provide a little bit of advice, or if, if a company is looking to, to file a, a patent, we can, uh, we can make some recommendations there, but, um, you know, one of the other things that we're looking at, at developing is, is a, a, a list of, or at least just a, you know, someone where we can refer folks off to, because, you know, our, our employees here can offer some level of advice, but obviously we're, we're not going to be doing uh, a company's taxes. Uh, so that's that's certainly an, an opportunity. Um, we do hold a number of office hours where we're bringing in uh, vendors from the community and, and different folks who can who can add value with respect to marketing strategy or sales strategy or something along those lines. Um, and and those have proven to be fruitful relationships where you know a a, a company or a, a, a vendor may come in and give away their services for free, but then it turns into a paying relationship down the line when the company's able to get off the ground. So, yeah. Who wants to be on a list? <laughs> I, I think that's good that you're aware that, um, you know, for a lot of businesses who provide business services like you're talking about, getting on to uh, a, an early stage company and, and riding that along with them is very, very valuable. So I hope that you do interact with the business community as a whole. Any other question? Ari. So the question is, again, um, is this altruistic or is there some financial gain that's uh, hoped for, I guess, right? So there are a number of instances where AOL has actually been an early alpha or beta customer of, of these startups. So, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of some of the cybersecurity startups, we, we utilize these products ourselves. So that's selfishly a, a benefit for AOL. Um, Fortunately, I have a I have a, another day job at AOL, so uh, I'm not a hit against the fishbowl program. Um, but I, you know, th there have there has been actually an instance where um, uh, uh, AOL, not AOL, Verizon has invested in one of the fishbowl companies uh, urgently. It, it wasn't a sort of a, a, a planned opportunity, but it just sort of happened uh, actually uh, right before the, the acquisition of AOL uh, by Verizon. Um, so certainly with, with the investor relationships that we have, AOL has a couple of venture funds, uh, Verizon has a, a substantial venture fund, so you know, if it makes sense and it's a good investment opportunity, we always try to pass those along as a way of uh, you know, being good corporate citizens, but also um, you know, trying to do well by the entrepreneurs that are in our program. So you know, they're certainly, and, and I'm asked about this a lot, of I whether or not um, you know, Fishbowl ends up being kind of a, a front for AOL's investment opportunities, if Verizon's investment opportunities, and, and the answer is it's not, but certainly if 
you know, we can we can do well in the branding aspect, do well in the mentorship aspect, provide a development opportunity for our employees, and maybe if there's some you know financial opportunity for us down the road, uh, whether it's a uh, you know a, an operating arrangement or or an investment opportunity, we we certainly do try to take a look at those if we can. But it's certainly not the uh, the rationale for for the program itself. Sure, but you know Verizon especially is a pretty structured company. I mean, they used to be the phone company, right? So. Um, is there a line item somewhere on a budget that is the fishbowl that gets scrutinized by at some point in time? I mean, could could you walk into a meeting and they go, "Oh, hey, by the way, you know that number's too big," or just just talk? I, you don't have to give away any secrets or anything, but uh, no. how's it work? No, no. All right, all right. I'm not going to ask that question again. <laughs> 